Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Burbank Studios of Collider Video, and we are so glad you decided to make us a part of your day, especially considering Transformers are fighting Nazis. Also <laughs> here is Christian Harloff. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Nice to see everybody. Happy that the Giants play it's so, oh wait, I'm in a parallel universe. <laughs> also, here's Mark Ellis. That's right, them Redskins <laughs> took down the Giants and the Transformers gonna beat up on them Nazis. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> We've also got a special guest today, Mr. Jeremy John. What? I guess we're uh, we're throwing out football commentary. So the Seahawks won, and I'm a happy man about that. I have no hick voice to go along with this, so thank you, oh, Mark Ellis. Come Ellis. on, JJ. <laughs> Bull crap. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Should they go really with the first good. story? Like, yeah, it's going to be one of those days. All right, Ashley, what's up first? All right, though some fans believe Captain America's Civil War ended the feud between Team Iron Man and Team Cap, that might not be the case. According to the Russo brothers, Civil War was only the beginning. In an online Q&A, Joe Russo answered a fan's question that asked which side they believed won, with Joe responding with, we always thought of this move as the start of the war. It's not over yet. John, what do you think about the comments the Russos made about Civil War not being over? I mean, on one hand, it's really interesting because, yeah, there is still an issue. You now have half of the Avengers are basically mm -hmm. fugitives out there running away. The Sokovia Accords are still in place. That's still a deal. And Captain America and his team still ain't signing up to him. So on that side, it's totally understandable. On the other hand, it's a, it's a little bit of an interesting statement, confusing-wise, because... At the end of that film, by the way, might as well, let's put up the uh, spoiler alert there for people. For anybody who has not seen Captain America Civil War at this point, and I can't imagine a lot of people who watch this show haven't seen Captain America Civil War yet, but by the end of the film, like, Steve is writing this let letter to uh, to Tony. Tony has kind of double-crossed Thunderbolt Ross and was now helping help Cap a little bit at the same time. They were kind of mending fences by the end of that film. But now, at the same time, then you get the post credit scenes. Captain America's now in Wakanda. Is the U.S. going to try to come and invade Wakanda, which we know from the animated films is the only country on the face of the Earth that's actually equipped to fight off an alien invasion if they have to. So that'll all be interesting. So I don't know where they're going to go with this. Christian, wh which direction do you see this going in? Well, I mean, as far as the direction, I I'm not sure, but I will, I'll tell you that I'm not surprised that it that it wasn't over after Civil War. I, I wasn't one of those people that thought, oh, it looks like everything's back to normal because, yeah, Cap writes Tony that letter at the very end, but he's breaking everybody else out, the, his side, he breaks them out. Who knows where they are as far as, they're not going to be working together with the Avengers because it'll be pretty simple to find them. Um, mm. But we also don't know the events of what's happened or what's transpired from now until when the first movie comes out. Uh, or I guess there's not two movies anymore, but the next Avengers movie comes out. So we don't know how Ross is going to be handling Tony or, or what he knows, if they can kind of fix things up. But yeah, I like the idea that we're st they're still going to be kind of at ends and they're, they're going to have to come back together when the bigger threat of Thanos eventually comes. I think that that's what I always thought would happen. It's that this little, let them figure out the little minutia on, on the ground right now. But when the bigger threat happens down the line, they're going to put all the squabbles behind, including Ross, and say, all right, let's band together and let's take on the bigger threat. You know, just as a side note, I, um, I watched the the premiere episode of the new season of uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Everybody knows, historically, I'm not a big fan of the show. I gotta say, the first episode was pretty damn good, but they're referring to a brand new director. Coulson's not the director anymore, and a lot of people are theorizing it may be Thunderbolt Ross. Mm. That Thunderbolt Ross may be the new director, and they're kind of keeping that hidden. Anyway, Jeremy, you hear the Roosters talk about the Civil War's not over, so mm. how do you think this is gonna play out? Yeah, whether or not it's gonna be uh, Captain America versus Iron Man, Tony Stark versus Steve Rogers, don't know about that, but I think, I mean, it, it would only be logical if the Sokovia Accords are still in effect. You know. Right. I mean, like this big threat's coming, but that doesn't legally mean that thing over there ended. Right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Tony Stark turning a blind eye, like, all right, let Steve do his thing. We're not necessarily fighting anymore. It's kind of irrelevant to the fact that it's still, the law is still in effect. And so, like uh, Christian said, the U.S. government's going to have to be like, all right, something bigger's happening. So we're going to have <laughs> to really decide whether or not we, can, we are going to turn a blind eye and let them do their thing. Or if we just want to continue to douche out. We'll see. Mark, it's not going to take long to rip that piece of paper up. Once <laughs> Thanos starts acquiring Infinity Stones, that's when you really need to look at it. I mean, you would assume that Thanos is going to be the galvanizing force for everybody to make nice again. I inferred that they were doing that, that they were clearly on their way to do that by the end of Civil War, is that, okay, Tony and Cap, they had this 
huge fight. They're going to disagree on some issues, and maybe that's going to become more personal when it, when you're talking about the Winter Soldier and how you handle him going forward, more so than the political things that are going to be going on, because that all goes away mm. once you consider the intergalactic implications. So I get it. They're still going to need to mend some fences, but they also have some time to do that, not just in, in Avengers Infinity War, but in these other movies that are going to be coming out the lead up to that, they can kind of pepper in what's going on in the world until we actually get Infinity War. All right, what's next? In a report from The Sun, Michael Bay and the production of Transformers The Last Night have taken over Winston Churchill's former home, Blenheim Palace, to reimagine it as Adolf Hitler's headquarters. This stirred quite the controversy from veteran groups, and so Michael Bay released a statement to BBC, and in doing so revealed another character in the movie. I just want to say people were not fortunate enough to read the script, <clears throat> and they don't know how Churchill is in the movie, is a big hero, and Churchill would be smiling about last night. They haven't seen the movie. They they don't know the ending and they don't know how Churchill is a hero in this movie. So as the staff said, he'd be smiling right now. Jeremy, what do you think about the addition of Winston Churchill and Nazis in Transformers the last night? This is the greatest dumb <laughs> news I've ever heard in the history of my life. All right, as someone who got their start on YouTube talking about Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, it was the first video I ever did, hearing that Michael Bay is doing Transformers where Optimus Prime has Excalibur fighting Nazis Nazis in space. This is the like you can't make this up. This is a Family Guy joke, right? Yeah. You know, and now we have Winston Churchill being a badass in a Michael Bay movie. It sounds horrendous, yeah. but awesomely horrendous. <laughs> it's the way. Yeah. This is a drinking movie, if ever there was one. <laughs> what do you think, Ellis? I mean, that picture doesn't look good, you know. But <laughs> but then you're like, oh, okay, it's a movie set and they're filming it. I think it's a, I think it's much to do about nothing. To be honest with you, because look, you can say a lot about Michael Bay, and boy knows I have. I don't think he would do anything on purpose to disrespect veterans or go back and just. He's not pooping all over <laughs> Winston Churchill's place. He's. If you're filming a movie set where the guy is a hero, so as stupid as I think this movie sounds, and I hated that first line of his quote because he said. The people who were fortunate yeah. enough to read the script. Who's lucky reading that script? Right. Who reads that script, gets to page 18, and is like, oh, I won I, the lotto. I read the Transformers script. Yeah, it's a, you don't need to ever read that in your life. I didn't know that they actually shot with a script. I really thought they just shot up. They're like, you know what? We got those Nazi banners in storage. Let's make Transformers fight Nazis. This movie gets dumber and dumber. It's becoming a sci fi network show. But I think this, this particular incident is a lot of people complaining about something that I don't think is that important. Yeah, page three explosion. Page four, explosion. Page five, bent over ass shot. Page six, explosion. More bent over ass shot. Slow motion. <laughs> slow motion and bent slow motion. Prime. That's it. Yeah. Nazis <laughs> open the ark. Okay, so let me get this straight. Now, a, a little bit of history on this. I love the first Michael Bay Transformers movie. I did. I loved that movie. I even, I got choked up a few times because I grew up playing with those damn things. That first time Optimus Prime comes driving through the mist in the back alley and then the camera does that swinging thing around as he transforms for the first time. I got choked up. It was that emotional. Wow. I see the way you're looking at me, judging me. Yeah. No, no, yeah. you can just I am. stop. I, I, I judge not. I had fun with that movie until John Turturro. But like, I, I, I'm, I know what you're saying. So I mean, I like the movie. Okay, now fast forward through three subsequent horrible movies, and now we get okay. First of all, he's going back to King Arthur. Okay, and his sword apparently is the sword and the stone. Amazing. All right, and now he's fighting Nazis. So Transformers is unofficially Bill and Ted's 3, where he's going to go through time, find out, and, and now, I'm sorry, you're setting up a Nazi headquarters in what was in real life, Churchill's home? Isn't that kind of like taking Martin Luther King's like ancestral home and turning it into the, the, the base for the asshats and the Ku Klux Klan? <laughs> isn't that like, isn't that like a little, like, so Michael, you gotta understand that some people will look at that and go, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't, now, I, I will say this. What if there's a little bit of time fixing That's supposed to be happening where it's like, oh, the Nazis won a certain battle and they took over Winston Churchill and that is supposed to be Winston Churchill's house. It's not just a stand-in for it. That's his house and they took it over and it's supposed to be making some kind of point in the movie. I get it, but still, I, you're right. It sounds like something the family guy would say. Uh, Michael Bay is going to make the Transformers fight Nazis. <laughs> like, like what? But I will, I, I'm going to say this, okay? I remember saying how stupid that first, by first I mean the, of the recent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies, the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles looked stupid and horrible, and I actually went in and I ended up liking it. I remember how absolutely awesome 
the last Transformers movie looked. It looked incredible. Optimus Fra Prime is riding a Dinobot. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That looked incredible, and that was like one of the worst movies ever made. Why am I getting this sneaking suspicion this might be the first good Transformers movie? Is this going to be one of those again. weird... I know, I'm <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid. Anyway, Christian, what do you think about all this? It makes me nervous, because remember they said, hey, we're going to have all these great writers in this think tank room, and they're going to come up with this great idea. This is what they came up with. I mean, it's a matter of, you see them sitting around. And I don't even think this is what happened. I think Michael Bay walked in one day and Stephen Denight, or whoever else was in their room, was like, hey, you know, last night I watched this great uh, documentary about the Kings of Camelot, uh, the Knights of Camelot. And oh, yeah, I was watching this Nazi thing. Great, put it in the movie. No, 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 no. And then they put it in the movie. But I do agree that I think that what they could have done here is just build a set. They didn't, you know, instead of maybe just dropping it on, the fact that they're doing this for Churchill, I think it's, I can understand why people will get upset, but I do agree with you. I think that they probably will screw around with time a bit right. and say, this is what happened here. So that's what he's talking about with the script itself. I don't think that it's, and I do agree with him that I don't think he is going to try to piss off anybody who veterans i mean look pearl harbor is an absolute mess and he should have never thrown a love triangle inside of that story itself but i don't think he was ever saying oh i'm gonna really screw with the veterans he's not he's a guy that does respect veterans he does and you've seen him you've, you've i seen don't think any about? filmmaker respects the, the servicemen and women more peter berg maybe like him and peter berg yeah. like they they have a complete love for servicemen and women so in, i completely and i'm not a, a bay supporter at all as you guys know but i don't think he's trying to throw any disrespect at anybody let's see what the movie movie is but it doesn't change the fact that it sounds incredibly ridiculous even though, wait i'm fighting nazis you know it's, like, it's, it's 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 pretty ridiculous i mean it, it almost here's what it feels like a little bit they got that great writer's room but it's almost like they didn't write together it's like everybody come up with an idea great you came up with your ideas let's put them all in the yeah. same yeah. movie together. So you together you thought of them in king arthur's court you thought of them with nazis right. you thought of them in i don't know going to the moon for the first time we already did that too so Nine. So I will have to see how this all works out. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theatres. Mm -hmm. The Magnificent Seven was indeed magnificent at the weekend box office, taking in $35 million in its first weekend of release for an easy number one. The other wide release, Storks, grabbed the number two spot with $21.8 million. Coming in at number three was Sully with $13.8 million. At number four was Bridget Jones' Baby with $4.5 million. And rounding out the top five was Oliver Stone, Snowden, bringing in $4.1 million. 1 million. Mark, thoughts on the Magnificent Seven's box office performance? Ashley, I'm happy to see the Magnificent Seven clearly being number one. $35 million. It didn't do the $40 million I was hoping it would, because I really like that movie. It's a great action ride. I would recommend y'all check it out in theaters. Storks is something that I think that the market spoke for itself when you didn't have a lot of competition for kids going to the movie theater mm, this right. weekend. If that's what you were doing with your family, you went to see Storks. You're not going to see Snowden. You're not going to see Blair Witch. <laughs> You're not going to see Don't Breathe. All the movies that were competing for the top spot. It's actually nice to see Snowden. I'm fine with that being yeah. at number five. I think people are interested in the subject matter a lot more so than Blair Witch, apparently. But don't breathe. Just the fact that it gave Snowden and Blair Witch a run for their money to be at the five spot shows what a movie that is. It's a movie that if you if you make a horror film with good word of mouth, it's going to hang around. Blair Witch, on the other hand, I know it wasn't made for a lot of money. It was, its budget was only five million bucks, so it's doing just fine. But it doesn't have that same impact as don't breathe. Yeah, I was really happy to see uh, Magnificent Seven do what it did. Like, And I think if it dropped in something like, I don't know, a July or maybe even like a March kind of date, you'll probably see it in the 45 million range. But this is a nice number for this time of year that it pulled in, especially when it's going in and opening up against an animated family film like Storks, especially Storks since it didn't turn out too bad. I kind of like that movie. Um, my box office predictions from Friday were almost perfect. I was reading down the top five, like number one, yes, I got it. Number two, three, four, oh, but I blew the fifth mm -hmm. one. I think I think I had uh, Don't Breathe in the fifth spot. I think you put uh, I Blair, had Blair Witch, Witch yeah. in the fifth. So we both missed out by that much. Anyway, Christian, which of these things stand out to you the most? Well, I think it's Magnificent Seven because I, I'm going to disagree with the fact that I, I don't think it would have done as well in the summertime because I think of the kind of competition that it that it would have, mm -hmm. the, the, the types of movies. I think Fuqua has really hammered down the September and October those are his months he mm. knows how to hit movies and it, like you look at the Equalizer just beat out Equalizer I think Equalizer either came out in late September or October around the, around that time it's right before the big Oscar rush you get it's it's like a mixture of like a summer movie meets a wannabe kind of contender but it's, it's a popcorn film it's a fun film I really enjoyed watching it and 35 million I think is a great number for it it'll do okay in the following week but the other movie that stands out not so much Storks is like you're saying Mark it's the only one 
right there. It's Sully again with another 13, just kind of peppering in. I think Sully's going to have a really good takeaway by the time it finishes out. Sully's now over 90 million yeah. domestically, and I, do, I never would have guessed right. that it would hit 100 million. Mm-hmm. It looks like it might at some point. Anyway, Jeremy, which of these things stands out to you? Uh, yeah, I love the fact that Magnificent Seven uh, made number one because I love a good Western. Um, Tombstone's just one of the best for me. I just love that movie. And it rem- I mean, it's, it's like I said in my review, it's Western 101. Like the premise yeah. is every right. Western, a lot of Westerns you've seen. But uh, but um, I'm 50-50 on the summer thing. It's like on one hand, I think if it came out in the summertime, it might have gotten buried. However, it's summer 2016. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So it might have stood out, but it doesn't change the fact that now there's a fall movie. It's definitely that movie in the fall that we're going to remember. But if you just look at like the, the lineup, you got the action movie, you got the Western, you got the kids movie, you got the Oscar contender, you got the date movie. I would have put the horror movie at number five, but as Snowden's there, and that's fine too. That is a horror movie if you look at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of Rash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? In an interview with Shortlist, Sam Neill revealed he will reunite with both his Hunt for the Wilder People director, Taika Waititi, and his Jurassic Park co-star, Jeff Goldblum, and Thor Ragnarok. Speaking about his role, Neil said, I'm not really allowed to say this, and I can't tell you what it is. I did a couple of days on Thor just before I came over here. If I say anything else, Marvel's secret agents, and they are lethal, will come and get me and probably my children as well. <laughs> Christian Byersell, Sam Neill, and Thor Ragnarok. I buy it. I mean, I, uh, Sam Neill's one of those guys. You buy him and anything he's in. Oh, he's going to be in The Crow Part 7 on direct of Blu-ray. <laughs> buy it. It's Sam Neill. It doesn't mean I have to buy the movie, but I do buy Thor Ragnarok anyway. So adding him and the fact that he's just coming off of the working with the director beforehand. And I actually got a, a chance to interview both of them at Sundance and their chemistry alone, just the way they, they're kind of interacting with each other. It makes sense that he would add him again to his cast because that's what a lot of these directors do. They feel comfortable. They know who's going to be able to bring gravitas to the role and Sam Neill does that even if you don't have chemistry with him if you don't know him you want to bring in someone like Sam Neill so yes please please bring him on to it, it goes back to we've said this a billion times over Marvel keeps putting in great talent not good great talent yeah. into their films and it helps the product so this is a big buy for me you know what you're talking about great talent even when it's little known talent they make sure it's great Absolutely. talent first you know when they're casting unknowns at the time they make sure it's somebody's got a history they know how good they are they've seen their work the casting people have been raving about them to go to get them when they're going to get known names they get the best of the best whether it's a robert redford or uh, uh sir ben kingsley or who or sir anthony hopkins or whatever they go out and they get the best of the best sam neill fits that list he's one of these guys who will probably go down as a character actor, but one of the best there's ever been. When he's in a film, he elevates the film. Like, whenever we talk about Hunt for Red October, obviously we talk about Sean Connery, and obviously we talk about Alec Baldwin, but Sam Neill is amazing in that movie, and I think elevates it. He will do the same thing here, impressive cast, I buy the hell out of it. Anyway, Mark, what about you? I mean, I'd rather see him lend his time to something like Transformers the first time, you know? Because like, he could bring the dinosaurs back from Jurassic Park. They could fight Nazis. It, you know, it'd be a lot more fun than whatever Thor Ragnarok finds. Sam Neill's in it. Of course I'm going to buy it. The guy's awesome. I love him from even before he was in Jurassic Park, and he does have such a wide variety of roles he can pull off, so it makes sense that they would want him for this. I buy, I, I sell him getting out of the movie alive. I mean, he, he did two days. There's going to be a lot of fighting happening. I don't know if Sam Neill survived the movie, but the fact that he's in it is a huge credit to it. Jeremy, I agree. Uh, Sam Neill in anything, I, I, just to add him to the cast. Have you? I saw a lineup of the cast in Thor Ragnarok. It's you like just look stupid. at that. This yeah. is the greatest A-list thing, and it reminds me of the uh, Disney movies in the '90s. There was a point where every actor wanted to be a voice in in a Disney mm. movie. It was really cool if you were, and it's like Marvel has hit that. You know, people want to be in a Marvel movie. They're like, they're they're the live action Pixar. And uh, adding him to the the all star lineup, you got me teary eyed because now I'm thinking about how he never got to see Montana in uh, Hunter Red October. <laughs> but I'm glad he's in it. I really am. All right, what's next? With production on Jumanji now underway, Sony has announced a number of new additions to the cast of the film, which also reveals the plot for the sequel. Alex Wolf, Madison Iceman, Morgan Turner, and Sir Darius Blaine have all joined the film and are playing the real-world versions of Dwayne Johnson, Karen Gillan, Jack Black, and Kevin Hart's characters. Mashable's Jeff Snyder is also reporting that the stars are actually avatars inside the Jumanji game itself, and after the four teens get sucked into the game during detention, they take on the avatar 
forms in order to locate a jewel. John Byers sell the new cast members and plot details for Jumanji. I buy it because of what it's suggesting the direction of the movie. This is kind of interesting. So the characters that we see, The Rock, uh, Jack Black, Kevin Hart, they're not really the characters. They are simply the physical manifestation avatars of the teenage characters that are going into the game. Okay, that's actually kind of interesting and it's a departure from the original Jumanji. So I got to buy it simply because it's intrigued me. I want to know more about this. I want to see where they're going with this. I think this is a nice first step for me to buy. Jeremy. Um, yeah, I. all right. So we go back to the original Jumanji. When Robin Williams was stuck in that game for about 30 years or whatever, he comes out and it's this horrible place that he knows everything about. It's like, I mean, kill or be killed, you have to survive. Now we get to see that world he was trapped in, you know? Mm. Like we're now going into that world and immediately back when Jumanji came out, I wanted to see that world. So now I get a chance to see that world. I have no choice but to buy this because I mean, I just, I mean, they're showing us what I wanted to see from the beginning. Can I just say, if they make a Monopoly live action movie, how boring that movie would be to see the live action <laughs> you know avatar for that hat. They are making a Monopoly <laughs> live action I movie. I can't wait they to see who plays the top homes. hat. It's yeah. 99 homes. <laughs> yeah. Christian. Uh, it's a huge buy for me because mm -hmm. I I think it updates it's it's a question of how are they going to do this and you update the technology it's like maybe it's a, it's a virtual game or whatever it might be kind of playing off the te technology today of how there is an avatar inside the game and these kids come across it and they have to play inside this through the avatars and it's not the same board game pr premise they don't have to remake the game the, of the movie they're like ah why are they remaking jumanji now it's like when you hear dwayne johnson say that it is a continuation from before with upgrades this makes sense so and it also goes back to why is she wearing that half top and no one else is okay that makes sense it's an avatar yeah. so when you see all this and you understand that there's some kid playing as Dwayne Johnson rock that could be a lot of fun this yeah. movie has now shifted into a place it could become fun and something new and they're taking new liberties with it and I'm okay with that because you kind of have to 20 some odd years later with the way that the world works today with technology just a simple board game might not work the way it did in the in 95 you know I think it's fair to say that one of the Thanks, easiest sir. going laid-back people in our office is Perry she is so laid back and easy. But when this topic came up that Jumanji may not be a board game, might be a modern <laughs> digital game. Oh, she lost it. Oh, I thought I thought she was going to throw tables over. <laughs> she looked very upset. Anyway, Mark, what do you think about all well, this? Well, it's going to be a buy for me for probably the same reason that John and Jeremy bought is because it sounds less like a board game and more like a role-playing game because you are, you, you're an avatar. It's a representative. It's like Magic the Gathering. You're no longer just little old Mark Ellis. Now you're a wizard in this universe controlling stuff. That's the vibe I get from here. So I think it's a it's a fair update, and it's what we hoped Jumanji would do. It's not it's it, it's not retconning the events of the original. It's actually building upon the lore. Like what Jeremy alluded to that we already got in that first movie. What concerns me is if I played this game, which of those avatars would I be? Because I'm definitely not The Rock. Kevin Hart. Probably not Karen. I want to be Kevin Hart over Jack Black's <laughs> character. He doesn't look like he can survive the jungle that long. I'm hoping I'm Kevin Hart, but I don't know. But he looks like he knows the jungle. He, you, you look at you, Jack Black. He looks like he knows he might be the one to survive. He actually looks like he got killed right before they took the picture, <laughs> and they just propped him up. <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> All right, what's next? THR reports that New Line Cinema is dipping into mobile gaming territory with plans to adapt the mobile app Fruit Ninja into movie adaptation. J.P. Lavin and Chad Damiani are writing the script for the movie, which will revolve around a team of misfits who are recruited to become Fruit Ninjas in order to save the world. A release date has not been set. Jeremy, you buy or sell a Fruit Ninja movie. This is the best picture contender next to Optimus Prime taking on Nazis <laughs> with Excalibur. I have no idea how you would make this. Thing. I mean, Angry Birds wasn't, I mean, Angry Birds had more of a premise than Fruit Ninja has. If Angry <laughs> Birds doesn't really work, I'm not really, no. No, I sell this. <laughs> Christian. Yeah, I sell it. It's just, it's, it's, well, get me, well, the Angry Birds made some money. Get me an app. Make a movie. We got a Fruit Ninja. Make it. It's like, that's seriously what it seems <laughs> yeah. like. It's just like, they, there's taken every single app that they can find right now. It's this typical studio mentality. Something made somewhat money. Well, we have the properties yeah. to Fruit Ninja, boss. Fine, let's try it. Uh, uh, who cares? Yeah, it's movie vomit is what it is. Yeah, it it's is. like one of these things where like these mobile games make money. So if you can make it for a few million bucks and it makes a few million more bucks, you just made profit. It's the same thing they do with horror movies. All right. So here's the thing. Uh-oh. I My first reaction is inclined to agree with both of you ab about that thing. But there was this little movie called the Lego movie that I 
pooped on when I first heard it's like it's built like well, how do you make a movie around there's no intrinsic story there's no built in story to Lego no there's not but what they did was they took a recognizable IP to capitalize on that and then they wrote their own movie to it and then just layered it on the recognizable IP and it ended up working now we've seen it with Angry Birds and it didn't work but so it, it could work. So I'm not willing to dismiss it out of hand yet simply because of what happened with the Lego movie. Would I bet money on it? No, no, I would not. But I can see what they're going for. So very hesitantly, I'm going to buy. Mark, what about you? I'm going to sell my colleagues not respecting the mythology of Fruit Ninja. <laughs> All of the world building that has taken place in that app. I mean, this thing is this thing world is rich. Building. This thing is vast. This should be a trilogy like the Tetris movies, <laughs> which also have vast, rich history. I I am going to sell the fact that I would want to see a Fruit Ninja movie, but I'm going to buy it's happening. It makes sense why they're doing it. Angry Birds was not a great film. It ain't winning any Oscars. It's not beating out Kubo and the Two Strings for Best Animated Picture, but it made money. It, it, right. People went to go see it. They're going to recognize Fruit Ninja. If you can have it be really fun and engaging for people like us, like the Lego movie, awesome. More, more power to you. But if it just ends up coming out and it's like the Smurfs or it's like the Pez movie or it's the Emoji movie or Trolls or anything that might suck but also is going to make a lot of money because there's a market for it, I can't begrudge you your ability to go make a buck. Ashley, let me ask you this. Number one, are you at all interested in a Fruit Ninja mm -hmm. movie? And number two... What mobile game can you think that that is out there that maybe they could go next and make a movie out of? Um, first of all, I sell this so freaking hard. <laughs> Who thought of a Fruit Ninja movie? I've, I don't even recognize the app. I like to think that like I'm young and I'm hip. What is Fruit Ninja? I've never played Fruit Ninja. <laughs> and all these other movies that you guys are listing, like Tetris, you know, or like Angry Birds, like those are things that I recognize. And I don't think Angry Birds even performed to what people expect that it was gonna perform. Who is going to go see a Fruit Ninja movie? Not me. The only thing that could be worse than this, I think, and I think it's going to come, is a Bitmoji movie. A bit. Do you guys know what Bitmoji is? You guys are looking at me like I you don't know, know what Bitmoji I know they're is. An emo, they're making an Emoji movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that sounds terrible, too. I'm, I'm intrigued <laughs> by that, but a Bitmoji movie, it's going to come, I swear. That's what she said. Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> I would run over there and give you a high five. That was beautiful. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, Empire Magazine reports that Benedict Cumberbatch's commitment in playing Hamlet in London's Barbican in the fall of 2015 conflicted with Marvel's plans for a summer 2016 release date of Doctor Doctor Strange, and therefore the actor could not be involved. The studio then lo looked to Joaquin Phoenix, Jared Leto, and Ryan Gosling for the role, who all met with Derrickson when Kevin Feige ultimately said it's got to be Benedict. Marvel then changed their production plans to push the summer 2016 release to a later date in order to accommodate Cumberbatch's schedule. Mark Byersell, Joaquin Phoenix, Jared Leto, or Ryan Gosling as Doctor Strange over Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm going to sell that. I'm going to buy them that they would have been, you know, credible Dr. Stranges, but I'm not going to say anybody would have been a better Dr. Strange than Benedict Cumberbatch, and obviously I get to cheat because I've seen footage of Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. as Dr. Strange, and he looks fantastic from being the, this incredible surgeon, Stephen Strange, to when he's confronted by the Ancient One and he gets revealed this, this astral plane that exists. Watching the look on his face in that extended scene we got to see at Comic-Con was like, yeah, this is the perfect guy, and I don't think there was ever any doubt about that. Now, what I'd like to have seen somebody else as Doctor Strange? Yeah, perhaps. It's always cool to see a different take on a character. The one guy out of those three that I really would have rooted for would be Joaquin Phoenix because I'm just i I'm just done hearing about Jared Leto and his process and Ryan Gosling, <laughs> I, I just don't see him as Doctor Strange as much as I would see Joaquin Phoenix, so he would be my silver medalist. Jeremy. Okay, um, for all the shortlist actors that almost were the role, is, is it me or is Joaquin Phoenix on 9 out of 10 of those? He's on 9 out of 10 of the shortlist. Like, he was almost that He's guy. the modern day Christopher Walker. Where it's like, oh, you're <laughs> almost, almost Superman. Almost and Hans and got someone else. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't see anyone more than Benedict Cumberbatch. It would be hypocritical for me to say that I could because I was one of the fans tweeting that Benedict Cumberbatch should probably be Doctor Strange before <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch was Doctor Strange. But I really do feel like with that scheduling conflict, it was the fan outreach of them saying, no, we really want Benedict Cumberbatch. That made Marvel go, all right, well, let's try to get him to do it. So good job, fans. You made the world a better place. This is yours. <laughs> Christian. I'm going to buy it, uh, the Joaquin Phoenix part of it, because I don't, I don't buy th that it was just scheduling. 
because Joaquin Phoenix was pretty heavy into the negotiations. I think what happened is Joaquin Phoenix in the reports were that he didn't want to lock up to the big Marvel deal. I think they were very close in signing him, and I think Joaquin Phoenix almost was Doctor Strange. And now, you know, to say you've got a talent like Benedict Cumberbatch, you go, "Now nah, we always wanted him. We never wanted anybody else anyway." So I don't really buy that at all. I think we were very close to having a Joaquin Phoenix, and I think we would have been we would have been fine with the Joaquin Phoenix as Doctor Strange. But Benedict Cumberbatch looks. Like you said, we saw the footage. He fits in perfectly. This is the guy you want to play, Doctor Strange. I don't think we would have been in bad shape, though, had Joaquin Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Ryan Gosling, who I'm a big fan of, and both Jared Leto, big fans of, I don't see them as Doctor Strange mm -hmm. the same way I see the other two. I think Joaquin Phoenix would have been a different spin on the character, for sure. But Benedict Cumberbatch just kind of seems like he is Doctor Strange. But I would have been okay with Joaquin. What's, so what's interesting, too, is that at the time this was going down, these were three of the biggest names that hadn't committed yet to be in Anything, like a superhero right. movie going yeah, forward. Right. And what were we just talking about with Sam Neill is that, wow, is that there's not that many actors that haven't been associated with these because there's such high prestige projects in addition to being huge blockbusters. So now that Ryan Gosling is, is like maybe one of the last guys that's not tied up, interesting to think if he's not Doctor Strange, what superhero he might be, which world he might be in down the line. Look, I, I love that we have Benedict playing it. But uh, look, I believe, I buy the fact that I think any one of these three other guys would have done a great Doctor Strange. Why? Because they're all great actors. They're all great actors. I, I thought Joaquin Phoenix would have been a great Doctor Strange. I think uh, Gosling, because he's a great actor, would have been a, a great Doctor Strange. And I think what you said is very observant. You, I think you nailed on the head when Thank you said, you, like, the thing is, we've seen Benedict now as Doctor Strange. So it's difficult for us to imagine anybody else but i think we probably would have the same reaction if we saw a trailer with jared leto as doctor mm -hmm. strange i think that everybody was saying no one else could have played doctor strange when in reality yeah somebody else could have we've just seen him as that every like so many people hated on ben affleck as batman and then all of a sudden once they saw a picture of him as batman everybody's like now i can see it he's batman right and that's that's natural that's normal for us we we've seen benedict as it but he's absolutely would have been my number one pick to play it anyway and like he was your number one pick mm -hmm. and i think he was a lot of people's number one pick but i think we would have been in very good hands too if benedict had said no my schedule doesn't allow it and they had to go with joaquin phoenix or jared leto i think it would have been great either way but i am glad the way it kind of ended up ironically in the world of doctor strange there is another reality where joaquin phoenix <laughs> is playing doctor strange so there's that several realities well hey listen guys uh, we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday. And so at the end of this show, we like to save a little bit of time to take your live Twitter questions if you're watching this show live. How can you get a question in? It's simple. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. And then send on in your tweets. Wendy's keeping an eye on our Twitter stream right now, and she will pick out some questions for us to ask at the end. But also... Movie Talk is not the only show going up on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, we also have Josh McCuga and his team on TV Talk, which drops at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's when TV Talk goes up. Make sure you keep your eyes open for it. Tomorrow's Nightmares, and of course, an all-new Movie Talk tomorrow at 11 a.m. But for now, it's time for us to go to our mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions. We pick a couple out to answer every day. So, Ashley, what's in the mail? Bag. David Olinian writes, Hey Collider crew, I just wanted to know, how do you guys tell when an actor slash actress is phoning in a role? For example, I thought Jennifer Lawrence did a good job as Mystique in X-Men Apocalypse, but then I hear you guys saying that she wasn't really good and that she was phoning it in. For, I mean, I think it's different. Like, here's the thing. Acting is an art. And so as art, it's all subjective. It's going to hit people, different people in different ways. I look at Jennifer Lawrence in almost all of her other movies. I think she is in the elite of the elite as far as actresses working today. One of the top five working in the business today. She is world class. She's awesome. But when I see her in other ro roles, whether it's A Winter's Bone or any of the, the modern films she's done, m more recent films she's done, you can see she sinks into the role. She becomes that person. She, be, she develops a persona around that character and delivers that on screen. She's not a method person like a Daniel Day-Lewis or anything like that, but you can see her invested in it. When I watch her in the X-Men films, and I've loved the X-Men films that she's been in, uh, Apocalypse, not so much. I've loved the films she's been in, but I can tell she's not invested in it. She just, to me anyway, my perception, which is subjective, she just didn't care. And I really felt more like she was reading the lines right, but 
that's pretty much she's supposed to be angry okay she'll come across as angry but i didn't see her sink into that role like i see her sink into all of her other roles where she really becomes that character and creates that character and brings that character to life and i never saw that so when i see actors where just i sit back especially actors that you already know are really good and you feel like they're just there on set reading the lines. That That's what it does for me anyway. Mark, when does it seem to you like an actor is mailing it in? Do you think Jennifer Lawrence did or didn't? Well, as an expert on phoning it in myself, uh, <laughs> what I can tell you is that the more talented somebody is, ironically, the easier it is to recognize when they are, in fact, mailing something in. Because you're right, we've seen what they're capable of. And right. regardless of what the role allows them to do, you just get a feeling. I think it's more about emotion than it is anything else. Some of the greatest actors and actresses in the history of time have had roles where they probably phoned it in. Look at some later in life stuff that De Niro and Pacino have done. You can't tell me they were as committed to those movies <laughs> as they were to some of their previous Oscar winning efforts. Same thing with Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando is one of the great actors of all time. The Island of Dr. Moreau, he's got an earpiece in the whole time having people tell him what the lines are and I think he started to do that even as back early as, as Superman or you know something else, that, or Apocalypse Now, something like that. So it's not always 110% every time. Now having said all that, I still would of, I still think Jennifer Lawrence was better in Apocalypse than Olivia Munn was. You know, she's well, just, yes. she's got more talent than Olivia Munn does. A lot more talent when it comes to acting. It's just that we could tell it wasn't the it wasn't the full effort of Jennifer Lawrence. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, like you both said, it all comes down to the familiarity of the actor and how they portray their characters. But you look at Jennifer Lawrence. At that point, she was doing the uh, Hunger Games franchise. She was doing the X Men franchise. I mean, I think she's more at home doing the smaller personal roles. Right. And so when you're doing two huge blockbuster franchises just back to back to back, if she wasn't phoning it in at that point, I would think she's inhuman. So I completely understand why she started to phone it in at the end. Like, uh, for me, the... Uh, X Men um, First Class. I thought she was great in that one. I thought, I, I thought like, that was because, her best part. Yeah, because that was one. when it was you know new, and she wasn't Jennifer Lawrence yet, and now she's Jennifer Lawrence, and she's on all the marketing, and she's on all the banners and all the posters, and she's the focal point of the trailers, and she became the focal point of the plot. But uh, yeah, like you both said, it's all about. At a point, you can you know these actors, and then you can just be like, you can sniff it out. You're like, no, 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 no you don't care that much. Christian. Know? Well, it is subjective for sure, and if you want to go, there's actually a, a big page in the, I'll go to Wikipedia where it says phoning it in, and Bruce Willis is welcoming you there. <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, it's a matter, it actually, I, liked, I liked your wave. He does, he does. it's a gif, it's a gif, he's yeah. just going like this. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing is, with Jennifer Lawrence, I think also celebrity has a lot to do with it, mm -hmm. for sure, because yeah. you look at House at the End of the Street, that movie is atrocious. But it was what she shot that before she got Hunger Games. She did not phone it in that movie. No, the movie phoned it in, but she didn't phone it in. And she's locked in. And that's how I look at it. If an actor or an actress is, if I feel as I'm watching them, same, similar to what you're saying here, if they're locked in, if they kind of like Tom Cruise, I don't think I've ever seen him phone it in. I think I've always seen him locked into every role he's doing, no matter what it is. So even though I understand how they can get exhausted mm -hmm. at times too, I think though it's a job. And if for them, they should always try to be locked in and they should always try. Now, I know that a lot of times you get like the, the Al Pacinos and the De Niro's that maybe they're in the middle of a movie and they're just like, this is terrible. Ha. You know, he's just like, it's done. And he just, he just gives up maybe because he just, there's sometimes a guy who's, a, who's also maybe a producer because it isn't going to work. Now, is that the right mentality to have? No, but it certainly happens. Someone in the middle of it is just like, no. When, when Bruce Willis, I make the joke, when he takes a role now, something like, you know, uh, don't shoot the, the fireman in the foot part six that's going to come out. And he, you think he's going in there to give 110%? No, he's going in there to read lines and they just, oh, we got Bruce Willis' face in there and that's it. And he put his, his face and, and I'm holding his foot and it's on fire and that's all you need but <laughs> you know that 300 people right now are making don't shoot the fireman in the foot part six posters right <laughs> you know they're making that <laughs> right now that franchise <laughs> jumped the shark and fought when they had Nazis I mean they really you know. Yeah. Yeah. he's playing harmonica in that one right yeah, 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 I saw that. the Nazis yeah. All right, what's the next question? Eighth wonder of the world <laughs> rides. As you probably can tell, Kong Skull Island is one of my most anticipated movies of 2017. The original 1933 film is my all-time favorite film, and I am also a big fan of Peter Jackson's. However, with Kong now being bigger than ever, I was wondering, will there be big monster fights? One of the greatest parts of the King Kong history is his fights with the dinosaurs. Yeah, you know what? You cut out the first hour 
of Peter Jackson's King Kong movie. That's a really good movie. Yeah. The first hour was completely frivolous, didn't need to be there and whatever, but it's, it's a great movie. And now they're making him really big, but you're right. That, I, I didn't super love King Kong, Peter Jackson's, but there's no denying that fight with the T-Rexes was crazy good. Mm. Like, I can just watch that over and over again. It's so well done and it's visceral and you feel yourself like getting into it when horrible things happen. You're like, oh my gosh, like it's so well done. But now King Kong, they have had to upscale him. He's now like six times bigger than he was before because they got to get him ready to fight Godzilla. And what is it, 2020, he's got to fight mm -hmm. Godzilla or something like that. So, and Godzilla is a lot bigger than the traditional King Kong, so they got to make King Kong bigger. What King Kong steps on T-Rexes now. Mm -hmm. So what is, is this going to be like the classic King Kong of just Kong versus man? Or are they going to give some other type of creature for him to battle? And if so, what? Now, if Kong's on this island is that big, why not something else that's on this island? Maybe a mutated T-Rex. They probably won't go T-Rex on this. But it is a really good question. What does he fight? And I don't have a real good answer for it. Mark, what I'll do you I'll tell think? you what he fights. The Indominus Rex, baby, from Jurassic <laughs> World. Let's get three franchises crossing over into one. You can make dinosaurs bigger. Like, it's not that hard to make dinosaurs bigger. Who's going to be watching a movie and is going to be like, well, you know, I was just at the museum and I saw some dinosaurs or bones and I don't think this movie about a giant monkey checks out factually like it's fine it's just I want to see him fight dinosaurs which he did do in the 1933 version as well and then Peter Jackson just upped it to like this huge 20 minute awesome display of kick-ass battle I think you're gonna see Kong fight the locals whatever the locals are if they're T-Rexes if there's a bunch of pterodactyls maybe it's a gaggle of dinosaurs and they all show up to gang up on the Goliath of their island either way I'm with the eighth one of the world I cannot wait to see this movie Chris Listen, I think we're going to see him fight monsters for sure. And you yelled at me when we were talking about Godzilla when, when the Gareth Edwards came out. And I said, yeah. I guarantee you they're going to turn around Godzilla. He's not going to be the villain. He's going to be like the, the anti-hero that he's always been. And so has Kong. Mm -hmm. They made Godzilla the anti-hero at the very end of the film. They're going to do it again with Kong. At Somehow at the end, you're going to have to feel for Kong also. You don't want Kong to be the villain going in against Godzilla. You want to have to almost like... Tony Stark versus Captain America. Who are you gonna Who are you gonna pull? Well, the for? difference with that is that I walk into King Kong rooting for Kong. Like I don't no care what. about the humans at all. <laughs> yeah. I was I was mildly concerned about humanity and Godzilla. You're right. Halfway through that movie, as soon as they tease us with the foot, I'm like, that's yeah, my guy. And so that's the thing. So I think that be, in order for us to root for Kong at all, he's got to kick the crap out of some other monsters that aren't good. I want to see him be like, okay, because even in the, the the original, you see what what it is with his. The last one with Naomi Watch, you, you fell from when he's kind of goofing around with her. You're like, oh, it just reminds you, like, it reminded me it of my humanized daughter. him a Absolutely bit, yeah. it did. And I think that you have to do that again in order for us to care when he fights Godzilla. And I think a way to do that is not just him smashing helicopters. That's easy. It's him fighting some big, crazy monsters. And I think it'll happen. King Kong versus John Goodman. Mm. That's what's going to happen. It okay. could go down. He's what's also next, in Jay? fire in the foot. <laughs> was it, oh, you want my thought on it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, here's the way I see it. All right. So Godzilla and King Kong now take place in the same universe. So if you look to Godzilla monsters, maybe that's what King Kong fights on Skull that Island. That makes sense. Yeah. That's what I would do is I would uh, I would put a Godzilla monster that people may or may not have wanted to mm. see. Maybe they didn't see. Maybe they wouldn't see otherwise because they have plans for Godzilla. So you take that monster that Godzilla is not going to fight, have King Kong fight him on Skull Lined. There we go. Maybe that like a Gadira sense, yeah. kind of thing. Like a, uh, right. you, you don't want to give away Mecha Godzilla. Right. That's no, going to no, be no. in like 2035. Yeah. You definitely don't give away Mothra. I think but... Rodan's coming in the next Godzilla, so it can't be that. But they're going to get, maybe they give us teases as to what right. we could see. I mean, King Kong vs. Godzilla in 2020 it doesn't even have to be a movie. It can just be like a giant pay per view fight where they just have like a bunch of like creatures in cages and then we finally get up to the main event, which is King Kong and Godzilla, but they're not fighting. They do movie trivia. I love your vision. <laughs> yeah. I love your vision. I like this. <laughs> All right, guys, I said we'd save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your Twitter questions live, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Send them all in. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? <laughs> What's going on over there? I think oh, Ashley's got I'm engaged. Sorry. All right. The Lonely Wakandan <laughs> says, do you think Black Panther could open the door to anthology films with other Panthers? It's possible. I mean, look, success breeds continuation in mm -hmm. Hollywood. So, I mean, if they do a Black Panther movie and it crushes, let's say it becomes the first standalone movie outside of Iron Man that hits like that billion dollars, it's very possible. They could go further into the Wakandan history. Why not? It's there. I mean, look, Marvel has a lot of things on their plate. They have a lot of movies to do and a lot of characters to get through. And they are just one studio, so they're limited in how many they could do. So that would probably restrict going into Wakandan history a little bit, 
but like I said, success opens the doors for a lot of things. So it's totally possible. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, uh, speak with your wallets, man. We've learned that time and time again throughout the years. Uh, if you want a, something to get a sequel, go watch the movie. And uh, if you don't, don't watch the movie. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the, the Black Panther movie is quickly becoming that movie I'm really looking forward to in the Marvel Cinematic yeah. Universe between the director, the cast, everything. It's all shaping up. I'd love to see more of the mythos. But again, if you want to see it too, you go watch Black Panther when it's released. Well, I mean, just the end of Civil War. <laughs> right. When Chris, when, when Chris says to him, he's like, they're going to come. And he's just looking out the way. He goes, let them come. <laughs> yeah. So? I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, I would love to see a movie about this, the history of this country. Anyway, Mark, what about you? Oh, yeah, and, and if the comics are to be taken, then you can, there's a lot of lore in there to mine. I mean, I think there's a run going on in the Black Panther comic right now where there's two female Panthers. They also step in and kick some ass, whether it's for good or for evil. So it'd be interesting to see that. And you could even explore this further. A lot of the way that the fans talk about, oh, we'd like to see either a Hawkeye series or a Black Widow series on Netflix. You could also do a streaming thing on Netflix that could kind of transfer over. I would love to find finally see that crossover happen. I know that Marvel right now is set up to where Netflix and films don't really have to deal with each other, but if you could unite them a little bit more, maybe the Black Panther history is the right way to do it, simply because there's so much to get out of Wakanda that I don't know that you're ever going to be able to do all of that and justify it to the fans with just two or even three movies. Christian? Uh, not yet. I don't want to see multiple Black Panthers yet because I want to, I mean, I'm already so engaged with Chadwick Boseman as Black yeah, Panther. Good point. I want to see him in his own standalone movies. I want to see two. I want to see three of them. I want to see what Coogler does with the first one. I'm, and I want to hopefully that they attach him for two and three. And I want to really get attached more with Boseman as the single Panther. Now, that's not to say inside the movie, learn a little bit about the history because we know he's picked up right. the mantle down the line. So whether it be in flashback scene and we see the, the Panthers that have come before him and maybe in the third or fourth movie, I think that, that sometimes that happens to where you might need that device now that maybe there is another Panther or something as he gets older down the line and it fits into the MCU. That could be interesting, but I don't think you need it right now. I think let's let's really, w no one will deny that he was one of the standouts of Civil War. Mm -hmm. He did it on his own. Let's see him just as a Black Panther. I want to learn more about the character now. They have my interest of just learning more about this version of Black Panther before I need to see other ones. All right, what's next? Mr. Yasman 300 says, do you guys think Anthony Hopkins might be playing Churchill in Transformers 5? It makes yeah. complete sense. Yeah. I mean, right? So, because like you think about Anthony Hopkins and Transformers, what what is he gonna do? Then you hear that Churchill's gonna be a big hero in this. I, is Anthony Hopkins gonna be riding Grimlock now? Is that what's gonna be? How, ah, oh, how that be? Um, I, I think it would make sense if I had to put money on it. I'd say yes. I mean, obviously, he could be playing anything. We just don't know. And if you really want to cross up the universe, he's playing. He's playing Odin. <laughs> he's playing Odin. Right. That's what's going to happen. And it's really? Odin's sword, which is also Excalibur, which is fighting right. the Nazis. the Nazis. It's exactly what's going to happen, Mark. What do you think? The smart money would say Churchill, but I'm not going to totally go away from my belief that he could be somebody in King Arthur's court as well. So it's like, well, it's, yeah. it's, I, I think that if Vegas had the odds, I think it'd be like five to one that he's playing Churchill. Or Merlin. And maybe eight to one that he's doing something in medieval times. But, but he's definitely not playing a current person. Christian. Well, crap, you said that and you dropped my percentage down because that makes a lot of sense. I was at like 95 between Churchill and I forgot about the silly uh, Arthur, silly? Arthur court. Oh, Arthur. really? It's silly to you? All the Arthur stuff? Yeah, it's, it's silly to put to both in the same movie, yes. But you're right. He could absolutely play either one. But I'm going to say I, I'm going to go 85% that he's playing Churchill. 100% mm. you're not thinking along the lines of Michael Bay. Winston Churchill will be King Arthur. It'll be the same guy. That's how it's going to be. The go. man's name is Sir Anthony Hawk. <laughs> if you don't have him play Winston Churchill, this is called a missed opportunity. But yeah, totally going to be the same dude. All right, what's next? Albert Gonzalez Jr. says, What actor has gotten worse over the years the more they act? Brendan Fraser? Thank you. Oh, oh, oh Brendan. Oh, I like, oh, don't Brendan. be mean to Whoa. Brendan. Yeah. He's up here. I like Brendan. What do you mean? What are you talking about? The last, <laughs> the last thing I saw Brendan Fraser in was probably that G.I. Joe cameo he did. Right. Wasn't he Flint? Or oh, wasn't yeah. That like so a, what was he? He was, the, was he Sergeant Slaughter? Or no, no, no. I think he was. It might, was it Flint, though? Or it was one of those. I can't remember which one. He was also in a really small movie that Christian and I saw. I can't remember what it was called, but it was there was some sort of adoption going on, or a girl uh, from she was like from oh, the streets, right, and right, he was right. this affluent uh, guy, and his wife and him took this kid in, and he was good at it. He was really good. He didn't yeah. look like you know Encino Man anymore, but it was, it was nice to see. Him. Yeah, Brendan Fraser uh, in his early career, you got to remember he was doing Dudley Do Right. 
So I'm, I can't say the guy's gotten worse. You know what I mean? Like he's I, still I, the best screen Tarzan we've ever a, had. Who was Jane? Who was his Jane? Uh, in in uh, George of the Jungle. Yes. Uh, Margot Robbie. I'm gonna go with Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Judd Apatow's wife. Oh, Leslie Jane, Mann. Dame Mann. Judi wow. Dench. Oh. Yeah, that's where I kind of fell in love with Leslie Mann a little bit. Nice. Uh, what actors have gotten worse? Well, I mean. Actors don't lose talent. Yeah, it's, it's all like about phoning it in. And I'm, yeah, I'm not even joking. I'm going to say Bruce Willis. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, phoning it in conversation yeah, right. that we just had. It's one of those things where it's like, it's not that they've gotten worse, it's that they stopped giving a shit. Bruce about Willis, the world, I think the know? perfect example for Bruce Willis is look, we don't need an acting seminar in The Expendables, but The, the Expendables is a reason. Like, you look at Bruce Willis in that movie. And he's just Bruce Willis. He's in there. And then that transfers over to everything else he did. Because when you see that last Die Hard movie, that's the same performance that he just gave in The Expendables. It's just Bruce Willis thinking of what an action star is. You look at Die Hard 1, 2, and yeah. 3, that's John McClane. Mm -hmm, that right. is John McClane. John McClane is, has been dead for a long time. And then you just get some phony baloney guy running around saying, I'm John McClane. No, you're not. You're just a pissed off guy. Let's get John McClane back. <laughs> you're just yeah. a pissed off guy. You just punched a poor guy going to work to take his truck. Right. <laughs> you're a dude. Yeah. I'm going to say Macaulay Culkin. Guy has not gotten better since oh. Home Alone 2. <laughs> he's not improved. Guy. Really hasn't. Picking on Macaulay Culkin. What's the show he's been better. in where he's playing himself, but he's a barista? It wasn't the league, was it? Or was it not? It wasn't the league. It was another show mm -hmm. where, like, one of the characters comes. I'm telling you, that barista is Macaulay Culkin. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I can't remember what the name. It of that is show funny was. to see how some people just like they, they they try to distance themselves from what they were as a child actor. But like you and I were talking about with James Vanderbeek yesterday. It's yes, like, we were. He's made a second career out of playing James yeah, Vanderbeek, and he's doing pretty well for him. All right, let's take two more questions. All right, A. Clay says, "What animated movie characters do you wish were real?" Which, uh, I'm sorry, I totally missed that because which, this guy was distracted me, which, showing me which, things which, on the Which animated characters you wish were real? Oh, Thank this you. Is, uh, oh wow. Which anime character? Well, Optimus Prime, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Optimus Prime. Transformers has invaded. I'm not animated anymore. <laughs> I would follow Optimus Prime to the ends of the earth. I don't know. What about you guys? I'm going more with uh, with the Lion King because I want to believe that animals have that kind of like discussion amongst themselves yeah. when we're not around. Uh, I, I think that the Lion King, of all of the Disney movies, all, all the classic Disney movies, the Lion Lion King means the most to me, so I'd like that to be real. I'd like actual lions to be hanging out and having a conversation. I agree with you about the Lion King. I'm going to go back one Disney movie and say the genie from Aladdin. <laughs> oh. Oh. That's why I saw Christian's eyes perk up. I'm like, not before me, dude. Yeah, that's, a, that's the easiest the genie, one. Yeah, for sure. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Robin Williams with magic can do anything. This yeah. would be... I, I, the first thing I would do, well, I'm sorry. The third thing I would do would be free him. And I'd be like, my second wish would be <laughs> we like, we can probably my, guess what your first two would be. Oh, uh, well, the first one, definitely. <laughs> second one would be like, be my friend forever. Now you're free. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's one of the genius things about Lion King When does Lion King take place? Exactly. Uh, the 30s Nazi Germany. <laughs> 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 Anthony Hopkins playing Simba. There's a, there's a deleted scene when Scar is walking past the fire. Yeah. There's actually a stone with a sword in it. Right. And we just never caught it before. <laughs> Not, so the, one of the great things about Lion King is that you could say uh, it's 2000 BC. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 1925. And there's no right answer. I love that well, about that movie. I'll go back 10 years for myself. And then I'll make sure that Jessica Rabbit is real. Yep. Oh, oh, right. 2006 Harloff That's and right. Jessica Rabbit. Yep. Right. 2006 Harloff. That was my first wish to the genie, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take the last question today. I like that Christian went back 10 He was ten careful years. enough to say to <laughs> go back to clear, a smart man. I wouldn't do it. It would be pointless if I did it today. It's like, hi, how are you? Great. Cool. They're my friends. <laughs> All right, last one's from Tony Morrow, and he says, what are some... <laughs> <laughs> what are some recent movies that you don't think are as awful as a lot of people made them out to be? Uh, well, I mean, He's if you want to really to say it, but Batman v Superman. I, I mean, I know a lot of people super hated that movie. That's cool, and I kind of I liked it. I mean, even before the Ultimate Edition, I I liked it. It has has its problems, and I totally get that. But I think that's one that I don't think is as bad as uh, a lot of people make it out. I'll also say this: Fantastic Four. I mean, it's a bad movie, and there's no getting around. Mm -hmm. Fantastic Four is a bad movie, and it's a disappointment. But, I mean, like you watch, I mentioned this in my podcast the other day. I think all, a lot of us were in the theater at the same time watching that movie, and I, I know Schnepp was there too. And, like, the first half of that Fantastic Four goes by, and we're kind of looking at each other, like, this isn't half bad. Like, this isn't all that bad. And then it well, got pretty right, bad. Yeah. But, so at the end of the day, I thought Fantastic Four was a bad movie, but it wasn't like this 
horrendous, epically all time, like Catwoman uh, Battlefield Earth kind of bad. But I don't know, Jeremy, what are some that uh, a lot of people think you're just, just the worst thing ever, but you didn't think it was all that bad recently? Oh, this guy is trying to bait me into saying Suicide Squad. I'm going, oh. to, I'm going to say Storks because I don't want to say Suicide Squad because <laughs> the whole DC thing, it's over for me this year. I still love it. Uh, I enjoy the DC movies, but I ain't going there. You're Storks. clocking out until, yeah, yeah, yeah. until Wonder like, Woman no comes out. No more for that just... fight. I'm done. I've said my piece. Um, but uh, yeah, it would, uh, Storks for sure. What about you, Mark? I'm going to go with a little movie you may have heard of that came out in the mid-90s called Waterworld. It's known as one of the biggest bombs of all time. (laughs) It is known as a horrible movie. Go back and watch it. There's not a lot to complain about with Dennis Hopper completely going the other direction from Jennifer Lawrence mailing it in and trying way too hard on a jet ski as the bad guy. Kevin Costner (laughs) at his apex. It's a cool action movie. There's a lot of problems with it, but go watch Waterworld and just don't think about the fact that it was made for way too much money. Christian. I'm going to go with a movie that a lot of people don't even probably remember, and it's uh, The Switch with Jason Bateman and um, Jennifer Aniston. Oh, yeah. Aniston. Oh, yeah. It, it was a couple years ago. You look at like Rotten Tomatoes, and it's got really bad reviews, and it's a good movie, and it ate a pile of garbage at the box office. I mean, it bombed at the box office. It's a good movie. I mean, like a really good movie. So that was one to me that I couldn't believe I got in the negative reviews. And same thing with This Is Where I Leave You. I always talk about that one another Jason Bateman movie so those are two that I would say in the smaller side Wendy let's, let's go to you what what movie out there is out there in the last few years that everybody seemed to crap on but you actually thought was not all that bad I'm gonna get real controversial here okay I'm gonna say Ghostbusters 2016 I agree oh, I'll go with you I, you say I just don't think it was as awful as everybody thought I had fun with it is it a great movie no it's not do I want to see a sequel no I don't I think I've had enough definitely had enough talking about it but I don't think it's like complete trash like everybody's making it out to be Ashley what about you um, I'm also going to agree with B versus S because especially working here like I went into it <laughs> thinking that it was gonna be absolutely terrible but I really enjoyed it and also um, the wedding ringer with Kevin Hart not, yeah, that's a good one yeah, I thought it was hilarious I was crying of laughter the whole time but apparently a lot of, a lot of people liked it I hear a lot of people criticizing uh, the fireman who shot his foot <laughs> I know four. Yeah. Yeah. Four. four's alright six, six. five six. came out and sunk it and they right. forgot how six good the previous was the worst one was yeah. I'm just straight up switching my answer to showgirls that one yeah. taught me what it meant yeah. <laughs> alright guys that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk thank you so much for joining us remember the most important part of this show is not what we have to say it's what you have to say make sure you jump in the comment section leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discussed here today i want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me first of all sitting on my left mr mark arellis mark where can people find you online you guys can find me this friday at the movie trivia schmodown the ultimate schmodown continues and i have a very special opponent it's going to be a lot of fun we can't wait to talk about it in the meantime you guys can also find me on twitter at mark ellis live Sitting right over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, you can talk about it now. If you haven't watched, it's a little bit of a spoiler from Friday's match. But Mark Ellis will be playing, turn it off if you don't want to know, Josh McCuga. The semifinals match begins. And tomorrow, top 10, John Roca and Matt Nose go up against Rotten Tomatoes, Gray Drake, and Matt Atchity for a title shot. So check that out. And sitting over there, Mr. Jeremy Johns. Jeremy, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on YouTube at Jeremy Johns. Same with Instagram and Twitter, uh, Facebook at Real Jeremy Johns. And I got to say a special thank you to John Campia for letting me intrusively jump on your Collider movie talk today. <laughs> when I was like, John, can I come on? You're like, sure. I was like, nice. And sitting over there, of course, we'll start off with Ashley. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And Wendy. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ to watch mine and John Schnepp's show, Film HQ. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.